Welcome to the Ventilator and Pulmonary Mechanics Chalk Talk series, where we're learning how ventilators work and how to work with ventilators. I'm John McManigle. Let's get started. This time, we'll be examining how ventilators interact with patients who have a respiratory drive. We'll look at the most common patient-triggered modes, namely assist modes and assist control modes, pressure support, and intermittent mandatory ventilation and synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. These interactive modes, building on the pressure and volume control modes you're already so familiar with, really do make up almost all of the ventilation going on right now in your intensive care units and operating rooms. So let's get started with the difference between control modes and assist modes. We'll use volume control and volume assist modes to illustrate the point but the exact same analogy applies to pressure control and pressure assist. First, let's draw out volume control, which you're very familiar with. We start with zero flow, time triggers a constant flow breath, we cycle to expiration, trigger another breath, and cycle to another expiration. Circuit pressure starts at peep, there's an initial rise for inspiration, we follow the pulmonary pressure up for constant flow, and repeat for the next breath. The only difference between a control mode and an assist mode is how the breath is triggered. In a control mode, the breath is triggered purely by the timer set by the respiratory rate. In an assist mode, the ventilator is triggered by the patient trying to initiate a breath. And the ventilator detects that either with a flow trigger or with a pressure trigger. Let's think about how this works. The circuit pressure starts at PEEP because we're at end expiration. Flow is zero because the circuit pressure matches the pulmonary pressure. If the patient tries to take a breath themselves, the circuit pressure is going to go down a little bit because the patient is effectively sucking on the endotracheal tube. And that will also trigger a little bit of flow into the patient if the inspiratory valve is able to open. The ventilator then recognizes either the drop in pressure or the increase in flow. That triggers the ventilator to start its normal volume control breath with a set tidal volume delivered at a constant flow rate. And then the ventilator will sit and wait to be triggered by another patient breath effort. If the patient wants to breathe again one second later or eight seconds later or whenever it is, it happens again. Flow will start to rise a little bit, pressure will drop a little bit due to the patient's inspiratory effort, and the ventilator will immediately trigger another flow-limited breath. So there are a couple of things to recognize here. First, the trigger is different in volume assist mode. We are flow or pressure triggered instead of time triggered. But the limit and cycle are exactly the same in assist mode compared to control mode. So the patient decides when to start the breath but they don't decide when to end the breath. We're still flow limited, so the patient doesn't decide how much of a breath to take, and we're still volume cycled, so the end of inspiration is still going to come after you've met your program's tidal volume. One more thing to keep in the back of your mind is that in a pure volume assist mode, we are only flow or pressure triggered. So if this patient just decides not to breathe for a couple of minutes, the ventilator won't do anything about that, it just won't give any breaths. So in real life, you'll almost never see a pure assist mode. Instead, you'll see a lot of assist control modes. What assist control means is that the ventilator will have a flow or pressure trigger to detect patient-initiated breaths, but there's also a respiratory rate-based timer trigger that will start a breath if the patient doesn't initiate one. So let's look at how this works. We start in equilibrium with zero flow, circuit pressure at PEEP, the patient decides to take a breath, you get a little decrease in circuit pressure and a little increase in flow, that triggers a normal flow-limited breath, the patient triggers another breath, and the same flow-limited breath pattern repeats. But now, maybe it's time to change the patient's wound dressing or something like that, so the patient gets a big slug of narcotics, which blunts their central drive to breathe. In the background, the ventilator has calculated the cycle time from the respiratory rate. So for a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute, the respiratory cycle time is six seconds. 
And every time a breath is triggered, that timer is set. So after the first breath, it's set a deadline six seconds later. Because the patient triggered an assist breath before the six seconds was up, the ventilator was perfectly happy. But when the ventilator saw the next breath triggered, it again started the six second timer. This time, that timer expires without a patient triggered breath. Based on the time trigger, the ventilator will start another normal flow limited volume control breath. Most ventilators will show assist breaths and control breaths, and that's the terminology used, assist breaths and control breaths for patient triggered and time triggered breaths respectively, in a different color on the ventilator graphs. Most ventilators will also calculate a quote unquote spontaneous minute ventilation which is what the minute ventilation would be, counting only assist breaths and no control breaths. There are a couple of things to think about here. Sometimes, if your patient is doing really well and you're weaning them from the ventilator and they're firing their own assist breaths consistently, you might set your respiratory rate to some absurdly low rate, like four breaths per minute, to test them. That way, you have a backup rate so that if they do unexpectedly become apneic, they survive the experience, but you can prove to yourself that their drive to breathe is enough to be life-sustaining. One other detail of assist modes to have in mind is that traditionally, there is no restriction on how soon after one breath finishes, the next can be triggered by the patient. For that reason, especially in volume assist mode, you're theoretically at a very high risk of auto-peep or breath stacking, as we discussed in lecture two. In real life, in order to prevent this, ventilators have one more built-in safety in assist mode. In addition to having the six-second time trigger before it fires a control breath, the ventilator also has a lockout window time within which the patient can't trigger another breath. It's usually called a window parameter or something like that. So, after any breath, there's a period during which the patient can't trigger another breath, then there's a window during which the patient can trigger a breath, and then there's a time limit after which the ventilator will trigger a control breath on its own. So that's volume assist control. Pressure assist control works exactly the same way, except that the breaths are pressure limited breaths, just like pressure control, instead of flow limited breaths, like volume control. Because one more time, the only difference between control, assist, and assist control modes is whether you're triggering on time, on flow or pressure, or on both. Once the breath gets started, it proceeds exactly like it would in control mode. The limit is the same and the cycle is the same. The next mode we're going to look at is different in that it adjusts the cycle as well. So let's look at pressure support mode. To understand pressure support mode, start out thinking about how pressure assist would work. Your flow or pressure triggered and your pressure limited. But instead of being time cycled like you would be in pressure assist, in pressure support you're flow cycled, which means that you're letting the patient both start and stop the breath. Let's see what this looks like. We'll start at end expiration, circuit pressure at peep, the patient initiates a breath, so pressure decreases a little, flow increases a little. The ventilator recognizes this inspiratory effort, which triggers inspiration. The circuit pressure increases to the preset inspiratory pressure. That creates an initial increase in inspiratory flow, which decreases as pulmonary pressure increases. Now, we're used to thinking of our pulmonary pressure as increasing in a regular fashion, which it would in a paralyzed patient. But in a patient who isn't paralyzed, the patient has some volitional control over this. They can lower their diaphragm and expand their rib cage to keep the pulmonary pressure lower, or they can use their respiratory musculature to increase their pulmonary pressure, just like you or I can. So as the circuit pressure stays constant at the set inspiratory pressure, but the pulmonary pressure changes depending on what the patient is doing, flow is going to vary a little bit. And in pressure support mode, the ventilator is going to have a preset flow rate, which acts as the cycle threshold. When the inspiratory flow declines to that limit, the ventilator cycles from inspiration to expiration by opening the expiratory valve and bringing the circuit pressure back down to peep. 
So if the patient wants to take a really big breath, they'll go ahead and trigger a breath, and then by expanding their chest, they'll keep their pulmonary pressure quite low for a while, and that will keep their flows relatively stable. And when the flow hits the cycle threshold, the circuit pressure will return to PEEP for expiration. If the patient quote unquote wants to take a smaller, shorter breath, then by decreasing their own compliance using their chest wall muscles, they'll cause inspiratory flow to fall off more abruptly and hit the threshold to cycle to expiration more quickly. Pressure support is an incredibly comfortable mode. You can have patients who are quite awake on pressure support. It's identical to the BiPAP mode of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, so there are some patients who go home and sleep in pressure support mode every night. It's also a great mode to wean a ventilator because the patient has control over their respiratory rate, their tidal volume, and therefore their minute ventilation. For the same reason, that makes it an inappropriate mode for patients without a solid central drive to breathe, either because of acute illness or because of deep or changing levels of sedation and narcotics. Just like we talked about in assist modes, if the patient doesn't trigger a breath for a long time, there is a backup. Unlike in the assist control modes, it's not as simple as just triggering an extra breath. Instead, the ventilator will switch its whole mode into a different backup mode if a pressure support patient doesn't trigger a breath for too long. Very commonly, that backup mode is a normal pressure control mode with time-triggered breaths. So there's a little bit of a difference in terms of what the backup is compared to an assist mode, but on any modern ventilator, there will be some backup to rescue the patient if they become apneic for a period of time. That being said, on a board exam or that kind of thing, they do sometimes include prolonged apnea as a historical complication of a support or an assist mode. Now let's change gears one more time. We looked at assist modes, which allow the patient to trigger a breath, and we looked at pressure support, which allows the patient to both trigger and cycle the breath. Now we're going to look at intermittent mandatory ventilation modes, which allow patients to take additional breaths separately from the programmed ventilator control breaths. To understand the development of this, in your traditional volume control mode in early ventilators, if the patient tried to inhale during the expiratory cycle, they would find that the inspiratory and expiratory valves were shut, so they were basically breathing against a wall. So maybe they could vary the circuit pressure a little bit, but they weren't getting any flow. This was not only distressing if the patient's sedation was light, but it also unnecessarily taxed their respiratory muscles. So the earliest iteration of intermittent mandatory ventilation did nothing other than allow the inspiratory valve to open if circuit pressure dipped below PEEP. So all that means is that if the patient took a little bit of a breath in when they weren't supposed to, the ventilator would allow a little bit of inspiratory and expiratory flow, whatever the patient was able to move by themselves at that baseline PEEP pressure. The other program breaths would proceed as normal. The ventilator wasn't helping the patient with their patient-triggered breaths or modifying its own time-triggered breaths in any way. So if you wanted to figure out what this mode looks like, you could just draw out your normal volume control breaths at regular intervals, apologies for my intervals not being terribly regular, and then superimpose little unassisted breaths on top of those. And of course, the ventilator isn't paying attention to those breaths at all. So if the patient is taking a small breath when the ventilator was ready to trigger an inspiration, the ventilator would just go ahead and interrupt the patient's breath with its own. Really, all this did was, as a patient comfort measure, allow the inspiratory valve to open up a little bit if the patient tried to draw a breath. The next iteration of this is called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, or SIMV, and it's exactly the same in terms of allowing extra unassisted breaths, but it's at least kind enough to the patient to say, if you try to take your own breath, and it happens to be about when I was going to give you a breath anyway, I'll start the program breath at that point. So I'll draw in these blue tick marks where the ventilator is thinking it's going to time its own respiratory rate-based breaths. And if the patient took a little mini breath right here, maybe nothing special would happen. And then the next timed breath would trigger as normal. 
but if the patient started taking a little breath here, that would prompt the ventilator to try to synchronize its effort with the patient's effort. And the advantage of this is that, again, it's a little more comfortable for the patient. They're not drawing against the closed valve, and if the patient is trying to breathe at a respiratory rate half a breath per minute faster than the programmed respiratory rate, they don't wind up in a weird, desynchronous rhythm fighting the ventilator. Now, the modern implementation of SIMV, which you'll see all the time, just adds one more element. Now, SIMV breaths usually have their own pressure support. So this truly is two different types of breaths that the ventilator is giving. There are time-triggered breaths that are flow-limited and volume-cycled, and there are voluntary breaths that are flow or pressure-triggered, pressure-limited, and flow-cycled. So what this looks like is you're at end expiration, the time trigger hits, you get a normal volume control breath with its corresponding circuit pressure, and then the patient tries to take a normal bit of a breath before the time trigger is ready. So that negative pressure and positive flow triggers the voluntary breath trigger. Just like in pressure support, now the circuit pressure is increased to a preset inspiratory pressure and the voluntary breath is cycled to expiration when the inspiratory flow decreases to a cycle threshold. So expiration on the voluntary breath starts when the inspiratory flow decreases to that threshold. The advantage of this is that it reduces the work of the patient a little bit more. The patient's voluntary breaths are no longer 100% patient effort of drawing what they can at PEEP. Instead, the patient gets the advantage of pressure support in terms of their respiratory work. This mode is very common in intensive care units and sometimes used in operating rooms as well. So let's really take a look at the parameters that you'll need to set. You'll really need to set everything you would normally need to for both volume control mode and pressure support mode. For the time triggered volume control breaths, you'll need to set a respiratory rate You'll need to set a tidal volume and IDE ratio so the ventilator can figure out the flow limit. And of course, the tidal volume is also the volume cycle. For pressure support, in terms of the flow or pressure trigger, you'll have to set some sort of trigger limit, although usually whatever the ventilator has set by default is fine. You'll need an inspiratory pressure to act as the limit for your pressure support breaths. And again, you'll have a flow cycle threshold, but usually the default value on the ventilator is fine. So the most important parameter you set for the pressure support breaths is the inspiratory pressure. And I should also point out that just like our other synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation mode, if the patient initiates a breath right around when the ventilator was going to give a volume control breath anyway, the ventilator will go ahead and trigger the volume control breath early. And of course, we looked at volume control SIMV with pressure support, but pressure control SIMV with pressure support works exactly the same way. The only difference is that the time-triggered breaths are the pressure-limited, time-cycled pressure control breaths that you know and love. So do make sure you understand this mode pretty well before moving on, because it is one of the modes you'll encounter pretty frequently in intensive care units. All right, so let's wrap up this talk. We covered the most common ways that ventilators incorporate patient-triggered breaths into their ventilation modes. We talked about assist and assist control modes, where a ventilator triggers its normal programmed breath using a patient-initiated flow or volume trigger instead of a time trigger. We drew this out in some detail for volume assist and volume assist control, but the exact same principle applies to pressure assist and pressure assist control. We looked at pressure support mode, wherein pressure-limited breaths are both triggered and cycled to expiration by the patient's effort, giving the patient complete control over their tidal volume and respiratory rate. And finally, we looked at the evolution from pure control modes to intermittent mandatory ventilation, then synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, to today's very common control modes plus SIMV with pressure support voluntary breaths. And again, we drew this out for volume control SIMV, but the exact same principle applies to pressure control SIMV. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll see you next time.